Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Alexi and uh, Ravel and Adam, for having me here. And I'm really glad I can talk to you guys today. And very quick introduction, I'm Anurag. I'm currently a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley. And today I'm going to be talking about Succinct, which is a, a system that we've been working on at AmpLab to enable fast interactive queries at scale on huge volumes of data. And this is a joint work with Rachit, who is currently a uh, professor at Cornell, and my advisor, Ion Stoika, at uh, UC Berkeley. You might also know him as the chairman of Databricks and the company that started uh, Spark. And I'll just dive right in. Uh, I don't think I have to convince, given the, the audience I have here today, I don't think I have to convince any one of you that we all want to uh, perform complex analyses on uh, larger and larger volumes of data. And we want to do so without giving up on performance. And in fact, interactive latencies often correspond to uh, latency of the order of seconds or even sub-second latencies. And uh, no matter how complex your analyses are, they can always be decomposed into different kinds of primitive operations as such, including operations like search. You might want to uh, look at all the tweets that have been made by AmpLab about succinct. Uh, regular expressions where you might want to un, you know, filter out all the documents that contain links pointing to domains from uh, Stanford or uh, berkeley.edu. Range operations, you might want to actually uh, filter out tweets or Facebook posts that you've made between 2013 and 2016. Or you might want to perform complex operations and graphs. For example, in a social network, you might want to look at all the friends of your friends who enjoy tracking and analyze that data. In addition, there are a bunch of uh, seemingly simple operations like aggregate queries or random accesses and updates, which become challenging given the scale of the data that you're performing this on. And to cater to all of these different kinds of operations, we've come up with uh, a variety of increasingly complex systems. For instance, we've built compute platforms like Spark and Hadoop, which enable uh, arbitrary computations on huge volumes of data. We've also built query engines on top of these compute platforms, such as Spark SQL, um, Cloudera, and uh, uh, Cloudera's Impala and uh, HBase, which allow us to execute SQL and relational operators on these compute engines. And finally, we've come up with data stores. Uh, at one hand, you have data stores like MongoDB and Cassandra, which enable really low latency and high throughput read and write operations. Uh, and on the other hand, you have search-based uh, data stores like Elasticsearch and Solar, which focus on search-based operations and more complex operations like regular expressions while maintaining interactivity. Now, uh, most of these systems are pretty good at what they do. I'm going to say most, not all, because you always have some systems that we don't like. But uh, the problem that uh, I'm going to, in this talk, I'm going to focus on two problems that almost all of these systems run into at some point or the other. The first problem that I'm going to talk about has to do with degradation of performance when the total amount of data grows much larger than the am amount of memory that you have in your system. To show my point, we looked at a generic system uh, uh, that caters to big data. And uh, the name of the system is not important for this demonstration purpose. But what we did was we measured the performance of the system in terms of throughput, that is, the number of queries uh, that it can serve per unit time, as a function of the total amount of data that it has to handle. And what we found was that, essentially, as long as the data can fit in memory, your performance is pretty decent. As soon as the data grows out of the amount of available memory, the performance takes a drastic spike, and you see uh, severe degradation in performance. The next, perform the next uh, problem that I'm going to talk about is catering to skewed query workloads. And the uh, setup that we, uh, we're going to be working with is a distributed system that scales horizontally using uh, partitions. So you have multiple partitions residing on multiple servers. And the problems that we look at is uh, the load distribution across these partitions in the distributed system is non-uniform. In fact, it can be heavily skewed towards one of the partitions. And the problem that arises is uh, you have a maximum sustainable throughput or sustainable performance for a particular partition. And the, there's a degradation for these systems when the skew results in the queries going much, much overboard, the, uh, much, much over the maximum sustainable throughput. And I'm also going to talk about our solutions to these 
two specific problems. Uh, and those are uh, two systems that we built that are succinct. And Glowfish, which builds on top of succinct to cater to these particular problems. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, I will have you convinced that uh, succinct as a system caters to the first problem by enabling a compressed representation that allows a large fraction of queries to be executed in main memory, which is the fastest storage. And it also enables a rich set of functions to be executed directly on a compressed representation of the data. You can perform queries like search, regular expressions, and uh, range operations directly on a compressed representation of the data. I'll also talk about how Succinct exposes a flexible support for different kinds of data models, including uh, data models such as key value stores, uh, columnar stores, tables, uh, and document stores. And finally, I'm going to talk about Blowfish and how it allows us to handle to cater to the second problem, that is handling skew, uh, query skew in these uh, distributed systems, and in fact, even cater to situations where the query workloads uh, have skews that change over time. So the, the skew across different data items change with time. But to begin with, I'm going to focus on the first problem, that is uh, the degradation of performance when the total amount of data stops fitting in memory. And as a running example, I'm going to use a flat, unstructured file, as shown in the slide over here, which is composed of differently colored blocks. And as a toy example, the query that I'm trying to perform is to search for all the green blocks in this file. Now, the first approach is to use data scans, which is prevalent in systems like Spark or Hadoop, where what you essentially do is you look at the data and you scan through each and every block in the data to find all the occurrences of the green blocks. Now, the problem with this approach is the same as with my animation. It's terribly slow. And at least very high latencies. Now, the good thing about this approach is you do not need to store any additional structures to support scans. You can essentially just look at the data and get your queries. And therefore, it has very low storage overheads. The other approach is to use indexes, which is common in systems like Elasticsearch or Sora, where in addition to your raw data, you would store an additional data structure called an index. In this particular example, the index is an inverted index where you map the different colored blocks to different locations where these blocks occur in the file. Now, if you wanted to look up the, uh, uh, find all the occurrences of the green block, you'd simply look up its index entry, and you get the result. So the good thing is you have low latency, but the problem is you have to store this additional index structure, which often leads to very high storage overheads. So, and this becomes a particularly big problem when you have very, already have a very large data set size and constrained amounts of memory, so that these indexes bloat your storage footprint even further and lead to your data set not fitting in memory. And this becomes a very big problem because you are essentially, when you're executing queries, essentially thrashing the cache, where the data movement in and out of the cache leads to very severe degradation of performance. And quite counterintuitively, use of indexes actually leads to worse performance in those situations. In order to cater to this problem, we've designed Succinct, which is our system, uh, to take a radically different approach. Now, what Succinct does is it takes the uh, raw input and it transforms it into a suit of data structures. The suit of data structures actually forms the compressed representation of the data, and you don't need to store anything except this compressed representation. And what Succinct enables is for queries to actually execute directly on the compressed representation of the data. Now, what this enables us to achieve is low storage because of the compressed representation, as well as low latency for two main reasons. First of all, our query algorithms are actually optimized to perform uh, to run directly on the compressed representation, leading to low latencies. And second, because of the low storage overhead, uh, you can always fit much more data in memory as compared to uh, the existing schemes, which means that you'll have a larger fraction of queries being executed in main memory, which means you'll have in-memory latencies which are much lower. Now, what differentiates Succinct from the other techniques is that you don't need to store any additional indexes. All of the query responses for these complex operations are actually uh, embedded within the compressed representation itself. Second, you don't require any data scans. So what we're essentially providing is the functionality of indexes without actually having to store them. In fact, we just keep a compressed representation of the data. And finally, we don't require any decompression as well. For most of the operations in succinct, these queries are executed directly on the compressed representation, except for a few corner cases where you actually want to look at the data, and you might have to extract uh, decompress a few bytes from random locations. Now, if you look back at our initial goals and see how Succinct fits in, Succinct achieves scale by being able to analyze data, data sets that are much larger than the available memory itself, 
It enables a large variety of complex operations, such as search, range, uh, range queries, random accesses, regular expressions, etc., directly on the compressed representation. And finally, it does, uh, provides these two properties without giving up on interactivity, which means we are able to execute these operations at much, very, very low latencies uh, because we avoid the overheads of data scans and data decompression for almost all queries. Now, I'm going to very briefly talk about uh, Succinct's internal data representation and how it actually stores the data to allow queries on compressed data. At a very high level, Succinct builds on a large body of theory work. So we looked at, actually looked at a very large body of uh, theory work that has to do with uh, you know, uh, indexing data structures and compressed uh, data structures. And the main uh, data structure that we picked up was the suffix array. And these suffix arrays are nothing but array representations of suffix trees. Now, the good thing, about, good thing about suffix arrays is that they provide very strong functionality. And in fact, these are full text indexes that support arbitrary searches for uh, arbitrary patterns anywhere within the text. The bad thing about uh, the suffix arrays is that they have very high storage overheads. And secondly, they do not possess any parent structure that would enable us to compress them. Now, the challenge comes uh, for, that, that Succinct is presented with is how do you actually achieve compression? And the approach that Succinct takes is to actually sample the suffix array. So instead of storing the entire suffix array, we store certain samples at periodic intervals. And in addition, we also store a set of pointers that allows us to compute the unsampled values on the fly. Now, I'd like to focus on the fact that Succinct is a lossless compression scheme. So you can actually compute all of the uh, unsampled values on the fly using these set of pointers. And the observation that Succinct exploits, essentially, is that these set of pointers possess a beautiful structure that allows us to compress it pretty aggressively. And without going into a lot more of the details, this is, in a nutshell, how Succinct supports really rich functionality on a compressed representation of the data. Now, I know I've skipped a lot of gritty, gritty details here, and I'd be happy to talk about them uh, offline after the talk, but I'm going to avoid them anyway because uh, of the, uh, you know, just in the interest of time. Instead, I'm going to focus on Succinct's data model. In particular, I'll talk about how Succinct enables a large number of different data models to be integrated through its unified interface, which means that we can uh, cater to data with models uh, that could be unstructured or flat files that could be in key value stores, that could be in document stores, or columnar representations, or even tabular representations. What Succinct essentially enables is for us to run the same powerful primitives that I described, that is search, regular expressions, range operations, on whatever the unit of data is for that data model. For instance, it could be values, documents, or columns. And to see how we actually achieve this, I'm uh, going to take a step back, and I'm going to take talk about the secret sauce behind what enables Succinct to do so. And the secret sauce essentially is a single unified interface which combines all the different uh, data models. And that uh, unified interface is a flat, unstructured representation of the data. And before uh, moving on to talk about how we actually integrate different data models to this single, unstructured representation of the data, I'm going to talk briefly about what kind of operations we actually support for this unstructured data. So. I have the same running example as before, the uh, flat file composed of differently colored blocks on the right. And on the left, we have the succinct rep compressed representation of the data. Now, all the queries that we support on succinct actually yield results in terms of the flat and compressed data. So for instance, if you were to run search, it would yield offsets into the uh, uncompressed file where the search terms occur. And uh, you could uh, perform random access into the original data by using the extract functionality, which in this example fetches the first five blocks in the original uh, unstructured data, uh, uncompressed data. You could also perform a count operation, which counts the number of occurrences of a particular term. And this is interesting because Succinct performs count at much lower latencies than the search. And we found that this enables a lot of neat applications, which I'm happy to talk to you about offline. And in addition, we also support uh, addition of new data to the compressed data store using an append interface, which allows us to append new data to the compressed uh, representation. I'll talk a bit more about the append operation in particular in a couple of slides. But for now, uh, I'll just quickly mention that range operations and regular expressions are also supported on the same compressed representation using an interface which is quite similar to search. OK, so uh, if I have no questions here, I'm going to move on to
uh, how we actually unified the, the different data models into a single unified interface. So uh, to show how we actually unify the different data models, I'm going to take a very simple example of a, col a, a table with four columns, as you can see here in this example. The first step that Succinct takes is actually assigns a unique delimiter to each of the columns in this data. So once we have assigned a unique delimiter to each of the different columns, the next step is to essentially transform this structured data, that is the table, into a flat, unstructured representation. In this particular example, by writing out the different column values separated by the unique delimiters, as you can see in the figure. And the final step is to actually transform the uh, flat, unstructured representation into the succinct compressed representation. And now you can support all of the queries on this flat, unstructured file, as I'd shown in the previous slide. Now, I know your uh, next obvious question is, I had a table to begin with. How does it help me to have a flat and structured file where I can run queries that may have no relevance to the original table? To cater to this problem, Succinct actually translates queries on the structured representation, that is the table, into queries on the flat and structured representation. For instance, if you were to search for all the green blocks in column one in this example, you would essentially transform this into a query on the flat file where you're searching for all the green blocks followed by the column delimiter for column one. Now, if you look at these two queries for a second, you'll realize that both of these queries actually yield the same uh, set of results, and you would actually get the results that you would expect from this query. So this is essentially the high-level technique that Succinct used for unifying all the different data models using a clever combination of delimiters and flat file representation, whether it's a JSON representation of data, or you have key value pairs, or you have column representation. Okay. So that's essentially uh, the, all about the data models. And I'm going to quickly move on to Succinct's architecture and talk about how Succinct's architecture is able to take care of supporting updates. Now, yeah? Right. Two questions. So uh, how are these delimiters complex? Who comes up with these delimiters? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so the question is, uh, who comes up with these delimiters? And what happens when you already have these delimiters somewhere in the data? So I, I have skipped a few details here. You're right to observe that. But essentially what we do is we translate whatever set of characters you have in your input into a, much, uh, into a larger, and you map it to a larger alphabet. So essentially you have some characters that are definitely not present in the input. And that allows us to actually use characters that are not present, present in the input. So essentially we pick these delimiters and assign them to the different data models, whatever data model you might have, and compress it so that there's no conflict between the data within uh, the uh, data that you've provided and the delimiters that we've chosen. That's essentially the thing. All right. So yeah, uh, the next problem that we have to cater to is in a compressed data store, one challenge that you have to overcome is supporting updates on the compressed data, because compressed data essentially is immutable. And the way Succinct addresses this problem is essentially using its multi-store architecture. Uh, at a very high level, Succinct has three different data stores internally, which are optimized for three different operations. The first data store, which is the largest store, is the Succinct store, which stores the data compressed using Succinct compression algorithms, as I had described. Now, this uh, data store is essentially immutable and only supports read-only operations. The next store is called the suffix store, which uh, stores a smaller fraction of the data and keeps it in an uh, uncompressed suffix array representation. If you recall, I'd, uh, I had uh, mentioned that succinct builds on suffix arrays as its underlying data technique, data, data indexing technique. And the suffix store essentially just keeps the suffix, suffix, store, suffix arrays in an uncompressed format. And finally, you have the log store, which stores the smallest fraction of the data which essentially keeps the data completely uncompressed. Now, when data, new data comes in, it essentially gets appended to the uncompressed representation in the log store. And any, uh, when the amount of data in the log store crosses a certain threshold, we essentially transform it into the suffix store. We convert the uh, uh, uncompressed representation into the suffix array representation and com combine it with the suffix store. Once the amount of data in the suffix grows too large, we essentially compress it using succinct compression techniques and append it to the succinct store and make it an immutable store within the succinct store itself. So by using a multi-store architecture, we're able to essentially uh, translate the updates periodically from the log store to the suffix store and finally to the succinct store where all of the compressed data is kept. Yeah? Uh, is it possible by policy to say that if the log store gets very large, there's some way to truncate it, even though this might have 
some effect on certain queries? So the question is, uh, it, given that you have some constraints on the size of the log store, you should be able to truncate the log store. Uh, yeah. So th that's essentially possible in succinct. What you can essentially do is preempt the uh, pre-existing threshold of when the log store may get combined into the suffix store. And you can say that at this point, I want to actually uh, dedicatedly uh, you know, assign some resources to compress the data into the suffix store and therefore into the succinct My store. My question was slightly different. OK. That given the fact it may already be in the suffix store, that is no longer issue. Just as it gets large enough at a certain point, for size reasons, it might be necessary to truncate. So assuming it's already in the suffix store, can you then decide by, pol by policy to, to truncate? Definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, I probably should have mentioned, made this more clear. But essentially, once the data is moved from the log store to the suffix store, and or from suffix store to the succinct store, the data in the original store is deleted. So you don't no longer keep redundant copies of the data in the other stores. So that's essentially the approach we take to actually get rid of all the redundancy. Yeah. All right. Right, so uh, the way uh, I would answer this question is essentially it's dependent on the data set. Because compression can vary widely dependent, uh, depending on how much redundancy you have. So essentially, uh, the amount of compression that succinct achieves is a fixed factor difference from what you would achieve with some uh, you know, traditional compression scheme like GZIP. For instance, we've observed that with different, we've looked at a lot of different data sets ranging from uh, text documents to binary data to even uh, JSON documents. And we found that we're al almost always within 1.3 to 1.8 uh, times of GZIP compression. So that essentially gives you a, a high level overview of what kind of compression we get. OK. So um, now, we've, uh, now all the techniques that I talked about, have, we have already incorporated that as a s different standalone system which can, you know, caters to all the problems of fault tolerance and uh, data redundancy, et cetera. But what I'm going to talk about today is our recent release of Succinct as a Spark, uh, as a pa package on top of Apache Spark. And I'm going to assume a certain degree of familiarity over here with Spark as a system in that it is a, a large-scale distributed system, batch processing system, that uses the concept of resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs, to perform complex analyses on huge volumes of data. And I'm going to dive right in and say what essentially succinct enables is queries on a compressed representation of the RDDs. So for instance, if you already had a pipeline that, were, uh, that, that worked with Spark, what essentially succinct allows you to achieve is new functionalities, first of all. Uh, we add document store and key value store interfaces to uh, Spark, where you can perform complex operations like search on documents or values. We also provide faster alternatives for some operations in, on RDDs. For example, you can perform random accesses and filters on the Spark RDDs at uh, much lower latencies. And the main reason we are able to get better performance is because we avoid the overhead of scans and that uh, Spark often runs into. And finally, uh, what applications can straight away achieve is the ability to push much more data in memory because of our compressed representation of the RDDs and uh, most of our queries being executed on the compressed representation without requiring any decompression. So these are the essentially the three things you would uh, that succinct enables on top of Spark. Now, uh, again, I'm going to provide a very brief overview of the different interfaces that succinct exposes for uh, Spark. And I'm going to assume a certain degree of familiarity with how succinct uh, how Spark's uh, Scala interface works. But if you have any questions at any point, you should stop me and ask me. The first interface that succinct exposes is for unstructured data using uh, the succinct RDD interface, where it essentially deals with data that has no apparent structure can, and uh, is, can be looked at as a single huge blob. And a typical example would be if you have a huge collection of logs that have no apparent structure in them. And in order to analyze this data, you would essentially start with importing the relevant classes in Scala. You would read the data into an RDD, as you would for any regular Spark RDD. And essentially, by calling rdd.succinct, you would compress it into a succinct RDD interface. 
And once you've compressed it into a succinct RDD interface, you can essentially uh, execute all the complex queries that I talked about. For instance, you could run search. Uh, in this particular example, we are searching for all the occurrences of Berkeley in this uh, entire compressed flat unstructured document. And the result is in terms of a collection, collection of offsets within the unstructured data where these uh, Berkeley tokens occur. You could uh, count the number of occurrences of the term Berkeley in the entire unstructured file. And finally, you could extract random uh, data from arbitrary locations in the uncompressed representation. For example, in this particular case, we're extracting 100 bytes from offset 50 into the compressed file. The next interface that we expose is for the key value store representation, which uh, is encapsulated in the succinct KVRDD interface. And the first step is essentially the same. You import the relevant classes for the key value interface. You read the data as a collection of key value pairs uh, into Spark as an RDD. And uh, once you call rdd.succinctkv, it'll transform it into the compressed, uh, succinct compressed representation for, of the key value pairs. Now you can perform operations like search, where you can find all the keys for which the values contain the term Berkeley, or whatever term you're searching for. And you can perform standard key value store operations like get, put, and delete. For instance, in this particular case, I'm fetching the value corresponding to key 0. So you could do the get, put, and delete operations that you would see in, typically in a key value store. Now, there are a bunch of other interfaces that we have also exposed, including uh, an interface for JSON documents, as well as a data frame interface, which works with Spark 2.0 to allow queries on uh, Spark SQL. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to dive into the details of those interfaces. Instead, I'm going to focus a bit on evaluation and look at how succinct fares against uh, real-world systems in real-world scenarios. So for the evaluation, we used a Wikipedia data set with 40 gigabytes of data. We used a distributed cluster of five EC2 machines with 30 gigabytes of RAM each. These five machines were slave instances. There's an additional master instance that controlled these slave instances. instances. The workload we used was entirely composed of search queries, where we searched for terms that had one to 10,000 occurrences within the entire corpus of data. And the system that we compare against was Spark without succinct. So Spark is a standalone system. And uh, we also compared against Elasticsearch. And uh, this uh, implementation of the, this benchmark was not within Spark. So Elasticsearch was isolated from Spark without having an overheads of talking to Spark. And uh, a few caveats that I'd point out is these are absolute numbers that are data set dependent. So I would like you to focus on the relative trends rather than the absolute numbers, which, you might, which might differ depending on the data set or the, the cluster setup that you might have. So if we look at the search performance, uh, here on the y-axis, I have latency in milliseconds in logarithmic scale. So if you look at the latency, uh, Spark, uh, when executing search queries either on disk or in memory, uh, yields a very high latency. And the main reason is because it has to perform full scans of the entire data set for executing any of the search queries. Elasticsearch, on the other hand, can achieve much lower latencies than Spark because it uh, can use these inverted indexes to speed up uh, you know, search queries. And I'd uh, point out that uh, all of these systems can actually fit their entire data set in memory. The performance for Elasticsearch would be uh, significantly worse if the data did not fit in memory. And finally, we have Succinct, which can uh, get even better performance than Elasticsearch uh, by executing queries directly on compressed data. Now, I would point that the difference between uh, Elasticsearch and Succinct performance is not fundamental in that these, uh, the benefits that Succinct gets is by avoiding some of the system implementation overheads that Elasticsearch has. So essentially, you could come up with a system that uses inverted indexes and gets a better latency than Succinct. But the key takeaway here is that Succinct on Apache Spark is almost 2.5 times faster than Elasticsearch. And this is while we achieve a storage footprint that is 2.5 times lower than Elasticsearch. Again, these numbers are data set dependent. You, you might get higher or lower gains depending on what data set you choose to use. And again, this is when the data set fits in memory for all of the systems. Another feature that we've recently added and I'm really excited to talk about is support for regular expressions directly on the compressed representation of data in compressed RDDs. So the motivation is quite clear. You have a large number of applications ranging from data cleaning and information extraction all the way to uh, bioinformatics and uh, even document stores that use these regular expression queries. 
And what essentially we support is all of the different regular expression co operators that you might see, like union, concatenation, wildcard, and repetition operators, directly on the compressed representation within the RDDs. And as a running example in the next couple of slides, I'm going to use uh, this regular expression, which essentially finds all of the URLs that correspond to uh, Stanford and Berkeley domains, so URLs corresponding to uh, links from these particular domains. In terms of interface, Succinct supports uh, regular expression queries on both the flat and structured interface, where uh, a regular expression search would yield all the matches in terms of the offsets in, uh, within the input where these uh, regular expressions occur, as well as the length of the matches. And uh, we also support the same operation for the key value interface, where it would yield the set of keys that, uh, for which the values contain this particular regular expression. So these are the two interfaces that we expose for regular expression searches. And uh, again, in terms of evaluation, if you were to look at how Succinct fares against the same systems that I discussed before, uh, described before for the same uh, setup and same data set, and if you use the regular expression query that I mentioned before, you can see that the latency on the y-axis is again in logarithmic scale. And Spark, uh, both on disk and in memory, achieves a very high latency. And this is because, uh, in addition to having to scan the entire data set, it also has to deal with the complexity of these regular expression queries, which are far more complex than search queries. Elasticsearch, on the other hand, is able to achieve almost two orders of magnitude lower latency. And this is because of uh, the Lucene indexes that it uses, as well as the libraries, uh, the regular expression libraries that have been highly optimized for these indexes. Now, I would still point out that even though these uh, uh, regular expression libraries are very, very optimized. They still need to scan all of the index entries to materialize the results. And in contrast, Succinct actually executes these regular expression operators directly on compressed data without any data scan. So you don't need to scan any index entries for this. And therefore, Succinct is able to achieve an order of magnitude uh, performance gains even on top of Elasticsearch. And this is uh, for a scenario when the data already fits in memory for all the systems. So these gains will only get much better for succinct if you were to push, push much more data in memory. <clears throat> so uh, before concluding my discussion on succinct, uh, succinct Spark package, I'm going to briefly talk about. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention that uh, we've already been. Our techniques are already being used at LZV Labs. They're using our Spark package. And I thought that the use case that they use it for might be relevant to the audience here today, so I'm going to talk very briefly about it. Essentially, their use case is to use it for annotation searches. And what annotation searches boils down to is they have a huge collection of documents, the folks at Elsevier. And these documents are essentially journals, uh, journal articles or uh, paper publications, uh, since they're essentially a publication company. And in addition to these documents, they also store annotations for each of these documents. So given a particular document, you annotate regions of text within the document with certain additional metadata. A particular annotation entry might look something like the example shown over here. You might have an, an annotation of type, type sentence or a noun phrase or a verb or a word. And a, a, corresponding to the annotation, you would store the region within the text where, uh, that the annotation corresponds to. For instance, in this example, the first annotation is a sentence annotation that corresponds to uh, characters 0 through 15 in a particular document. Now, uh, <coughs> annotation search actually involves complex analysis of both the set of documents as well as the set of annotations in tandem to pro pro produce useful results. Uh, and as an example, <coughs> this is actually an example that Elsevier Labs gave to us, is uh, we, they wanted to find all of the occurrences, uh, all of the sentences that talked about open problems in research in their papers. Now, you can imagine why I'd be, so, I'd be so excited about this, given that I'm a grad student. I would love if someone could just tell me all the open research problems, and I can pick uh, whatever I want to work on. But essentially, this, doing this is a very complex problem itself. So the first step would essentially be to come up with a regular expression query that actually captures this expression of open research problems. And this is uh, their attempt of actually capturing this using a regular expression query, which is essentially searching for uh, you know, uh, patterns like remains unknown, or is unclear, or remains uncertain. And the next step is essentially to find all of these expressions within the set of documents. Now, once you've found these set of documents uh, and the locations within these documents where these regular expression occurs, uh, 
you want to find all the annotations that correspond to sentences and contain these regular expression matches. So you would actually have to check against all of the character ranges and see which ones actually contain uh, the regular ex expression uh, entries. So this essentially boils down to be a very, very complex query. And this is just one of the simplest queries that they have. And what they essentially found by using succinct was uh, they were able to reduce the storage footprint of these documents and annotations, which can be huge, to a uh, much, much smaller storage footprint. Uh, they had reported gains of almost 13x over the uncompressed representation. And they can support all these queries at interactive latencies. So most of these queries run at the order of seconds or even subseconds. And uh, essentially, you could start using succinct on Spark today yourself by just going to this URL and downloading the relevant packages and running it on Spark if you have a Spark setup already going. And that's uh, essentially all I'm going to talk about about succinct on Apache Spark. And at this point, I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk about the second problem that I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. And don't worry, I'm going to uh, recapitulate the problem. The problem that we were looking at was essentially uh, you have a distributed system that scales horizontally by partitioning the data across multiple servers. And the load distribution across the different partitions in this system can be heavily skewed. So you could have some partitions that have a lot of load and the others that are not so much. And to put this in perspective of what I've talked about till now, we've looked at succinct and how it allows us to execute a larger fraction of queries in main memory. And now I'm going to talking about a problem where once the data is already in memory, how do you cater to skewed query workloads? And how do you even cater to situations where the uh, skew across the different partitions may change over time? So some partitions that are hot right now can become cold over time, and vice versa. As a concrete example, you can consider the uh, deployment at Facebook, which uses a bunch of MySQL servers to store the cold data. And they store a bunch of uh, memcached servers, uh, they use a bunch of memcached servers that cache the hot data. Now, the problem is that even in the memcached servers that store the hot data in main memory, there can be a huge amount of skew. For instance, you could have uh, this arising due to you know, really popular events, like, for instance, Pokemon Go being launched, and everyone's playing Pokemon Go and talking about it. So you, you have this becoming a very big phenomenon. Or, for instance, Donald Trump you know, saying a fun statement, and this becoming something very popular uh, among the people at, uh, for, for them to post about. So <clears throat> this essentially leads to a huge skew in their memcached servers. Now, since the data is already in main memory, you can't use caching to improve your performance anymore. So this is a real problem where a small set of servers uh, see a huge amount of queries and are able to sustain that load on those small set of servers. And a running example that I'm going to use for this particular, uh, for, for this particular problem is a system with 20 partitions uh, distributed across 10 servers. So you have two uh, partitions per server, for instance. And we use a load that is Zipfin distribution. And uh, the, what we observe is essentially the load on the most loaded shard is essentially 20 times higher than the least loaded shard. And the traditional approach to cater to this problem is to use selective replication. What you do in selective replication is essentially you selectively replicate certain uh, partitions based on how much load that they have. More concretely, the number of replicas that you allocate for any particular partition is proportional to the load on that particular shard. So if you have a partition that has much more load, you'll allocate more replicas so that it can sustain the load. Now, the main problem with this approach is that it's coarse grained. And to see how, consider a partition the, where the load on that particular partition is only slightly higher than what it can sustain. So something like 1.2 times higher than the, the load that partition can sustain. In selective replication, you would allocate two partitions for, or two replicas for that partition. And in a way, you're actually wasting 80% of the storage for the new partition that you've allocated because that's not useful. You only need to cater to 1.2x, not 2x of the throughput. And this becomes a bigger problem when you have uh, storage constrained uh, situations or memory constrained situations where the partitions are already contending for the cache as much as possible. So uh, this leads to degradation of performance because you're wasting a, a, a space for some uh, partitions that may not need it. The solution that we've come up with for catering to this problem is a system called Blowfish, which builds on top of succinct. And essentially, at a very high level, if you have uh, three partitions, as shown in this particular example, with loads uh, shown, as shown on the right, so the purple shard has the most amount of load, while the blue shard has the least amount of load, what you essentially want to do 
is to transform these partitions, change their storage footprints in a way so that the load across these partitions become well balanced. That's essentially the idea we want to pursue. That would be the ideal case. And what Blowfish tries to do is achieve exactly this. And to see how it actually achieves this, what we do is we look at different schemes that exist today, and we map their performance in terms of the throughput as a function of the storage uh, that they require. For instance, if you recall, uh, the use of indexes uh, require very, very high storage, but, performance, but provide high performance because they're able to speed up queries. On the flip side, you have scans, which require low storage, but, provide very high uh, but don't provide very high throughput. They have low throughput. And finally, we talked about succinct, which, provide, uh, which has an even lower storage requirement, but uh, achieves a throughput that's somewhere in between scans and indexes. Now, what Bluefish essentially does is it builds on top of succinct and enables a smooth trade-off curve between storage and performance, which means that you can uh, increase or decrease your storage footprint based on what your uh, performance needs are. In fact, what Blowfish does is it enables a dynamic navigation of the storage performance trade-off curve, which means that you can increase your storage footprint or decrease your storage footprint at very fine-grained time scales based on what your performance needs would be. As an example, if you have a sudden spike in the load on a particular partition, what you can essentially do is increase the storage footprint of that particular partition for a temporary duration so that it can cater to the increased uh, amount of load at that partition. And uh, tying this in perspective of distributed systems that uh, scale horizontally by partitioning, uh, Bluefish enables the storage performance trade-off curve for each partition in the system. Now, in order to uh, uh, enable the storage performance trade-off curve, Blowfish introduces a new data structure called the layered sample array. Now, I'd, I'd like you to recall for a moment, uh, I'd mentioned uh, several slides ago that succinct stores a sample suffix array where it doesn't store the entire suffix array, but stores certain samples at regular uh, location offsets within the suffix array. And in addition, it stores a set of pointers that allow us to compute the unsampled values on the fly whenever required at slightly higher computational overhead. Now, what Bluefish does is it takes the original sampled array. In this particular example, it has a sampling rate of 2, which means every second value is sampled. And it decomposes it into a hierarchy of layers. And each of the layers have a different sampling rate. For instance, uh, you could decompose this uh, sampled array into uh, three layers, where the topmost layer has a sampling rate of 8, where you store every eighth value instead of every second value. The layer below it has a sampling rate of 4, where you store every fourth value, except for values that have already been stored in layer 8 above it. And finally, you have a layer with sampling rate 2, where you store every second value, except for values that have been stored in layers 4 and 8 above it. Now, if you stare at these two representations for a second, they, you'll realize that they store exactly the same amount of data, or store exactly the same data, but in two different representations. What this new representation enables, and uh, that is the crux behind Blowfish, is that a uh, different combination of these layers leads to different points on the storage performance trade-off curve that I had mentioned. For instance, if you keep only the topmost layer, you have to store very few samples, which means that you have a very low storage overhead. But on the flip side, you have to compute a lot more values on the fly, leading to higher computational overhead, leading to low performance. So in a way, you can achieve low storage at the cost of low performance. On the flip side, if you stored all three layers, you have to store a lot more samples, but your performance is better because you have to uh, compute much fewer values on the fly during query execution. This means you can get much higher performance at the cost of higher storage fo footprint. Additionally, what uh, Blowfish also does is allows applications to dynamically increase or decrease their storage footprint by adding or deleting layers on the fly using uh, efficient uh, addition and deletion algorithms. Now, having a dynamic storage performance trade-off curve introduces several problems of uh, several uh, new problems in a system's perspective. For instance, you could look at a single server in such a system where each of the partitions have different, uh, you know storage performance uh, characteristics. So how do you actually uh, share the cache between different partitions on a local server? Now, the solution that Blowfish uses is it maintains a request queue for each of the partitions on the server, where each request queue simply stores the, uh, the collection of outstanding requests for that partition. So if you have a lot of outstanding requests in a particular request queue, this means that the load on that partition is very high. And if you have very few uh, requests outstanding in a particular request queue, this means your load is low. And what Blowfish does is it maintains a low threshold, 
So if a partition's key occupancy falls below that low threshold, it means that the load is insufficient and it deletes layers to free up some space. On the flip side, if you have uh, you know, a particular uh, partition where the uh, key occupancy grows beyond a certain high threshold, you add more layers to cater to the high increased load, but at the cost of higher storage overheads. So essentially, uh, the initial goal we started out with, where you want to be able to transform the shards or partitions in a way so that their, their storage footprint is proportional to the amount of performance that they need, is essentially what we achieve in Glowfish. Now, there are a plethora of other concerns as well that we have to address. For instance, now that we can cater to this problem in a single machine scenario, how do you share the global cache across multiple uh, servers, uh, across the different partitions that are there in the system? Moreover, if you have a replicated system where each of the partitions themselves can have multiple replicas, how do you share the cache across the different uh, par uh, replicas? And how do you schedule requests across these different replicas that may have different performance characteristics? Now, without going into much details again, uh, Blowfish uses a unified solution to cater to both of these challenges. And the solution is to use back pressure style scheduling. What back pressure style scheduling enables, essentially, is for us to continue sharing the cache f across the different partitions proportional to the load on these partitions. But uh, we do so in a distributed setting without requiring any explicit coordination. So we are saving a lot more uh, on the coordination part of uh, this particular scheme. Now, in, I, I know I've skipped a lot of uh, details here as well. And I'm happy to talk about these offline if you're interested. But I'm going to take a step back and talk about the performance. So as compared to the state of the art that you have in, in terms of catering to SKU, that is selective replication, Blowfish achieves 1.5 times higher throughput for the uh, running example scenario that I had mentioned a couple of slides ago. That is, you have, uh, if you have 10 servers with 20 uh, shards, we are able to achieve 1.5 times higher throughput than selective replication. And what's even more interesting is that we are, our performance for this particular scenario is within 11% of the optimal throughput that you could achieve for uh, this particular setting. Uh, now, I'm going to conclude my talk by just giving uh, you a brief uh, current status for all to the two of these projects. We have a standalone system implementation that uh, contains all of the techniques that are described for succinct as well as Blowfish, which we have prototyped as well as tested. And it's constantly evolving based on new feature requests as well as improving the performance. We also have a Spark package, for, which contains all of the succinct techniques uh, and, and uh, allows analytics on compressed RDDs. And uh, finally, we've also uh, open sourced all of the different succinct and Blowfish techniques in three different languages, in C++, Java, and Scala. And we've introduced these in three different languages because of ease of integration. So you might have applications that might, might use uh, these libraries in whatever language that they're actually implemented in. So that's essentially all I have for you today. And I'd be very happy to take any feedback and any questions that you might have about Succinct and Blowfish. And thank you so much. Right, so essentially, uh, succinct. Uh, yeah, so the, the question is whether succinct is a part of Spark, or did I just present it in a way that it seemed like it was a part of Spark? So, uh, in truth, succinct is a standalone uh, technique in itself, collection of technique in itself, which essentially enables queries to be executed on compressed data. And we have a standalone system that is, exists out, out, outside of Spark that performs all of these complex queries on. Uh, system that uh, supports high throughput and low latency. However, the Spark package that we have focuses only on the analytics aspect of it. So you could perform something like text analytics on Spark. And that's why I focused on uh, the Spark package today as a whole. Yeah. Probably a very simple question. But suppose you had like stock market data coming in, and you wanted to focus on a range of time, like December 5th, or right. December 5th. And then look at, say, count all the simple, simple, say, for a certain, certain stock. Can you first execute a query that will get you the offsets into it, and then have a secondary query that will only get the count with, within the, in that range? Definitely. So the question is, uh, given that you have a stream of data coming in, such as sto in stock markets, which as have associated with them some sort of uh, time identifier, 
and you want to perform a range-based operation where you want to look at only a certain window of time for those, uh, you know, for the data within, and you want to perform queries uh, specifically for that time window, can you actually combine a range-based query together with uh, a more complex analysis, such as, say, search on that time window? And the answer is definitely yes. So we do support range queries and uh, search queries individually. And all of these queries can actually be composed into perform more complex operations. And uh, the use case that I mentioned earlier, that is the annotation search, actually just combines one of these examples, uh, is one of the examples that we can uh, you know, support. And definitely, the stock market example would work with the succinct uh, use case as well. Okay, and uh, if you have no other questions, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Oh, yes. How much time does it take to compress that party with the array of the So that's a good question. Um, there are several components to that question. Given uh, you know that you're just asking about the Wikipedia data set, we essentially partition the data. And uh, I think we had about 40 partitions for it. And each of the partitions was uh, roughly about a gigabyte. And our uh, compression scheme currently supports compression at uh, I think 16 somewhere between 16 to 32 gigabytes per hour per core, but it is highly parallelizable. So you can essentially use multiple cores to speed up the uh, compression techniques. And uh, uh, so essentially, if you wanted you know exact numbers for how much time for, uh, it took for us to compress that particular uh, data set uh, for uh, one gigabyte of data, I think it took about 1 16th of an hour to compress it. Yeah. And that is only using one core. You could speed it up using multiple cores. OK, that's essentially all I have for you today, then. Thank you so much.